I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we're reading a book that was written drunk and we're editing sober. (laughs) If you don't want our version of it, you say, I like the way that the artist intended it. Well, then you can read the book yourself. But if you want us to do it for you, because I will tell you, I actually don't think that you should always be reading all the time. I don't think it's really necessarily good for the soul. Then I say, hey, we're going to read it for you. So come on by. Oh, guess where else we're coming? To Montreal. We are going to Montreal March 7th for a show that is our first ever 100% charity benefit. We're working with a local foundation called Montreal Community Cares. We are so excited. 100% of all the dollars that go towards the tickets are going to go back into the Montreal community. So treat yourself and treat your neighbor. Come on out. We're so excited. I do think we have a few more tour dates to announce and then the Everybody But Bug tour comes to an end. And I don't think we'll be doing another date until next spring. So If you're nearby, this is your chance. Come say hi, because who knows what could happen next year. Totally. And then, Claire, if you were to write a memoir about your life, what would you title last week's chapter? I'm proud of myself. Why are you proud of yourself? My February goal is to get my finances in order. As some of you guys may know, I've got a couple lawsuits I'm pursuing on the Patreon. (laughs) I've got some taxes that I need to handle. And recently, I'm just trying to like figure out budgeting and being more aware of where my money is going on a daily basis. And I recently downloaded an app to like help me sort through and categorize my spending. And you know what popped up on the app that was not, in fact, on my Chase banking app? What? A $1,500 Balenciaga purchase. (laughs) Oh, the one from when your credit card got stolen? Yeah, my credit card got stolen in November three times at the same Balenciaga. And then I guess they paid me back, but only for two. And I don't know if this third purchase was just in the ether, but it didn't pop up on my statement. And when I called, they were like, oh, yeah, just it's popping up now for some reason. But it was spent back in November. And I'm just like, wow, thank God that I chose to get serious about my finances because I really would have hated to have not realized that I'm paying $1,500 for someone else to have a pair of new pedo shoes. Am I right? You're right. (laughs) So if you've been waiting for the push to get a sense of what's going on in your life, let this be because it wasn't even in my app. Like I look at my own app and it wasn't there. It was like a ghost $1,500. And that's not nothing, especially for a little girl like me who's doing a 75 day no buy. It'd be really fucked up (laughs) to buy someone else a $1,500 gift. (laughs) I've never even been to Balenciaga in my life. So I'm not trying to help this person. And I just kind of feel like, I would like just one pair of jeans and I've said no to myself. So they should have to say no to themselves on my dime as well. Totally. (laughs) Didn't they know it's a no buy month? I wish you could make a little message pop up on your credit card. That way if someone else steals it, you could say like, hey, I'm disappointed in you because we said we're not shopping right now. You know I'm personally against overconsumption. (laughs) So like of all the people to steal from, it's not fair that it should be. If anything, if you're going to steal my credit card, go out to eat because that is something that I do a lot. Yeah. I would have been like sushi. On Tuesday at 3 a.m.? Could have been me. I don't know. (laughs) I can't remember. I do love sushi. (laughs) So, yeah, I'm trying to, instead of being upset that once again my credit card has to get canceled and I get all new, I'm trying to say, Claire, it pays. It pays $1,500 to be exact to be a little bit more on top of your own goddamn life. You're 32 years old. Totally. If you're interested in our experience with the old loser in Brooklyn, 75 style hard challenge, we've been talking about our experiences a lot on the Patreon. I think we've both had a lot of epiphanies and eye openers. And that is something that we're tracking and discussing. And I think we're really growing as people. Also, if you want to participate and you want to show your outfits to somebody, but in a safe, controlled environment, the Geneva, which we link every week in the bio, has a channel specifically for people to show other worms their cute little outfits. Totally. And Ashley. Yes, Claire. If you were a celebrity and you were writing a memoir, what would last week's chapter be called? It would be called, wow, years are long. Okay, I feel like weirdly- It's February 6th. (laughs) No, I feel weirdly young today because today is me and Bugs' two-year anniversary. Happy anniversary. I noticed you posted all those photos, but without a caption to give people the what's what. I thought I did post a caption. Maybe just didn't load on my little phone. Mm, Interesting. I'm using the word little a lot. I'm noticing that and I just want you guys to know, dear listener, you're not alone. I'm aware and annoyed as well. (laughs) (laughs) If only I could catch the words before they slip (laughs) out. If only I had any control over what comes out of this goddamn mouth. (laughs) Anyway, today is me and Bugs' two-year anniversary, and I, like, can barely remember not having her. And I feel like so much has happened since the day we met, since the day that I brought her home from her little orphanage. And I can't believe, ugh, I said little now, too. (laughs) 
It's contagious. But I can't. It is a little orphanage, though. Yeah, it was like a, a ramshackle, itty bitty place for unloved and unwed bastard dogs. <laughs> totally. And then they married her off to me. <laughs> her mom. Her wife mom. Every man's dream. I can't be a wife mom to a man. I've got a dog. Anyway, I feel like so much has happened since and I like can barely remember the before. And so it made me realize how long years are and how much can change in like a good way. Do you know what I mean? I feel like people have this sinking feeling as they get older where they're like, well, now the days are all behind me. But that's not really true. Like I remember when I turned 30 being like, I straight up do not recall what it was like to be 20. So 40 is 1 billion years away. And I feel that way again today being like, oh my God, I do not remember what it was like to be 30 years old with no dog. And so now, you know, 33 years old with a dog, that'll be a completely different me. Oh my God, that's exactly four months from today. Yeah, I think like quarterly life restarts. So there's just like a lot of opportunity for with things seasons, to go our that way. That feels very Hillary Burton. <laughs> yeah. A seasonal moon. Totally. I do think it takes three months for the moon to go around the earth, right? <laughs> I don't, I'm not the moon. Don't ask me. <laughs> You're my moon. Thank you. And I move on whatever schedule I damn well please. <laughs> also, haters, I know that the moon doesn't take a season. I was making a joke. I don't know why I'm in the mood to not like have to combat you people not getting jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like somebody's be like, Clara is such an idiot. <laughs> she doesn't even know about the moon. <laughs> they don't think you're an idiot. I'm I there's only room for one idiot around here. <laughs> no, there's always room for more. This is America, baby. Three hundred million idiots and counting. <laughs> So it just like made me feel hopeful about like, wow, where will things be one year from today? It's so true. So I'm excited. You know who actually always makes me feel that way? Who? <laughs> Shiloh Jolie Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> but you know something? I just go, I remember when your parents had secret paparazzi photos of them on a private island because your dad was married to someone else. <laughs> and I'm like, and now look at you. You're dancing at that L.A. TikTok gym. Life is crazy and it happens fast and things can change at the drop of that. I don't know. Something about her specifically. I'm like, the years keep hitting and they won't stop hitting. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Speaking of the way time slides by and things completely come in and out of relevance, should we talk about this week's book? Known Assaulter, Brandy <laughs> Glanville. Of the Me Too movement, we've got Brandy Glanville. Okay, this book wins an award right off the bat, I would like to say, for putting the most emphasis out of any other book on Twitter. We read a lot of books that take Twitter very seriously and you say, oh, if only you knew how irrelevant that'll be in 18 minutes. This has tweeting in the title. She also uses a lot of hashtags for linguistic emphasis. And something I find interesting is the linguistic speak that's supposed to signify hip, cool, young and with it and like irreverent. Mm -hmm. And I think what was once the BuzzFeed age listicle is now the Twitter age hashtag. Totally. I don't think it's just her, but I think a lot of people were told hashtags are a way to show them you get it, to make a punchline, to be silly and cool and just your older sister with a glass of wine. Well, let's go to her birthday because I don't think she was very old when this book came out. And so it really is insane how out of touch it reads because even in the moment, like this isn't how people use Twitter. This was how like 50-year-olds were like, oh, the young people with their hashtag cool girl tweets. Brandy Glanville was born November 16th, 1972. She's currently 51 years old, but this book came out January 2014. So at which point she was 41. Oh my God, that was 10 years ago. To the day, almost. Almost. Wow. Happy 10-year anniversary, drinking and tweeting and other brandy blunders, a New York number one bestseller, Times. I mean, I've said it once and I've said it again. That list is malarkey. The New York Times bestseller, just like President of the United States <laughs> and an Hervé Leger dress. These are all things that used to mean something. <laughs> These are empty symbols of power that have since crumbled and fallen like a mask. But I do feel like the way she like insists on being out of touch with technology at 41 is such a choice. But then also to like use it so heavily as a through line for this book is once again another choice. I wonder if, and excuse our lack of historical context, but I wonder if she was the busy Phillips of Twitter. Well, I think she famously tweeted some like pretty insane things about her breakup. I also find this to be 
an interesting book, not in the way that it's interesting, but in, actually specifically in the way that it's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in the lack of interest, we find intrigue. In that, I believe at the time this was considered a real tea spiller. There's a phrase that will one day feel dated and Brandy would not have understood back in 2014. But I think at one point this is considered like a gossip filled, no holds barred, no bars held, no pulling punches. The punches go over the waves into the ocean out of the sea type book. Totally. <laughs> but now I guess with social media and with reality TV, I don't know. Everything she says in here that I feel like is supposed to be like a mic drop you're like yeah we know yeah also i'm just like who cares but let's back it up really quick brandy glanville is known for her role on the real housewives of beverly hills which she got because she was known for her role as the scorned wife of eddie siberian who is known for his best role of new husband of leon rhymes who's known as the country singer who had like a chart topping hit when she was 13 years old. Thank you. Finally, a celebrity. <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord. If this was a desert and that was water, I would have been dead. <laughs> I don't know why I'm acting like this, guys. I had a Dr. Pepper before we came on, Mike. I got us these little hundred calorie Dr. Peppers. And I thought, well, this is just the zazz I need. And I'm too zazzy. <laughs> it was actually too much zazz. I will say 23 flavors. We should have split one. <laughs> I always say they should have stopped at 19. I've said that many times. Hey, so is you Hefner, am I right? Yowza. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. I'm so sorry. Calm. <laughs> okay, Claire. As the resident housewives expert, what is the vibe of Brandy Glanville? Give me like a quick three sentence overview on like what we know about her. Okay. First of all, I want to say I am not caught up in Ultimate Girls Trip. I'm sorry. I'm not like you weak minded fucks. I was not going to download a <laughs> brand new app to watch some old hags on a yacht. Okay. I said, you've taken my youth. You've taken my money. You've taken my brain power. I will not give you another five ninety nine. So I, don't, I haven't been caught up on UTG. But like on. But no, but Rehobaha. No, but I have to say, like, the new thing is big. She's being accused of sexual assault right now, which is not nothing. Oh, boy. I just want to say, I'm not caught up on the deets. Wait, we who will... did she assault? Caroline Manzo. Okay. <laughs> Former wife to the owner of the Brownstone, a premier wedding destination in New Jersey. <laughs> okay, so your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. My mom will kill you. <laughs> Do you want to come back and see my parents one day? I would take that back if I were you. I'll do it for Bailey. I take it back. <laughs> we'll research that for the Patreon. And I'm going to watch her first season of Housewives on the Patreon. Which is one of the craziest seasons of TV because that was back when they were just putting full-blown addicts on TV and being like, pretend that they're sober. It was <laughs> bananas back there and nice and grainy. It was very Italian kitchen hype. Does that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the kitchens had like very ornate. Yes. Do you remember when everything was beige and that was the height of fancy? It was like beige, but like mixed texture beige. Beige, like the hillsides of Tuscany, but in <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> and Beverly Hills. And Beverly Hills. Anyway, so how is she known on that show? Like, what's her vibe? Crazy, unfiltered, so tall. She was like the poor mom. Too with big to hang out, some might say. <laughs> She was like the poor mom who had like a crazy mouth and you wanted to like her, but you could never control her. She was loyal to no one. She went too far. She was like the first woman in that group who was like insane, even more insane than Kim Richards. But she was always saying what everyone was thinking. She was admitting to the secrets of the rest of the women who felt some beholden to like at least their own families or decorum. I think some of them were like, well, I'm not going to talk about your divorce, or your kids. And she's like, your kid's a stupid idiot. And you're like, he's four. But she was unfiltered and didn't care. So she mixed things up. She also always had the excuse of they're just jealous because they wish they were sexy. But I'm the only six foot tall woman in the room and I'm under 40 and I still have my period. She was that kind of broad. Yeah. She would be like, call you a fat, ugly slut to your face and then like drive in your backyard and hit your mom with her car and be like, <laughs> you're just jealous because my pussy's tight. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a part of them that was just jealous that her pussy was so tight. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't not true, but it also wasn't the whole truth. Totally. She's one of those housewives that even the production doesn't like. And I don't know if to mean this personally, but she's such a loose cannon that sometimes it just like you lose the plot. But then every time it got tired, they'd have to bring her back. She's always like shown up being like, I made out with Denise Richards. Like she refuses to play the game, but she is playing a game and it's hard to have two games happening at once. She's like if Trisha Paytas was so skinny and tall. 
Okay. It's like the lowest common denominator of like, I don't want this show to be Jerry Springer, but Jerry Springer has been on the air for 62 years, so you can't deny that it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I get it. I want to start off the book by saying that if you are gay, this book is offensive. (laughs) This book is crazy. She does this weird thing where like... She addresses like every offensive sentence to the ladies and gays. I guess she knows her audience. I will say, I don't think a straight man picked up this book once. She has one friend that she breaks up with and she's like, a friend of mine who was Asian. (laughs) And I was like, okay, that feels so irrelevant to everything. Like, nobody else gets race named except for, I'm like, I guess you really wanted us to know that you had one not white friend. Yeah. But I just don't know why because then you're like, I fucked her over and she fucked me over. Anyway, here's what I have to say about this book that I find quite interesting. So I don't know if you guys know this, but the way that we do this podcast is we read the book off in the morning of or day before. I sit down and I just read it. And then when we get on camera, a lot of you guys will be like, why don't you do audiobooks? And the truth is, because if you watch the video on YouTube, plug, we actually are holding the books in our hands as we go through. And it's we, a prop. No, it's not. It's like an important tool. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going through page by page and reading the quotes that we've highlighted and using like the highlighted sections to remind myself what as I was reading I felt was important to bring on camera. This is the first book I've ever read that I just didn't highlight a damn thing. (laughs) And not because I didn't have a highlighter or I forgot. I just kept saying, well, which of these sentences is important? And I kept saying, well, she's ramping up. She's ramping up. She's about to say something important. And then I got to the end of the book and I thought, oof. She never did. I've never seen someone run through so much content. It's like simultaneously the most overwritten and underwritten book I've ever read. It's so bizarre because, first of all, this book is 245 pages double spaced. I have never read a book faster that we've ever covered for this podcast. And I think that we have read some real shorties, some real pamphlets. We sometimes talk about how our general rate is about 50 pages to an hour. This book, I think I was doing like 80 or 90 pages an hour. Yeah, it was not a heavy hitter, but there's something about it where like each chapter is one story and the stories are not important, Mm -hmm. not important, but they do have a lot of like juicy details that are more than just a famous name or something. So they read quickly and easily, but you get through the book and you go, well, what did I even learn about anything? Like the things she says, she acts like are such a big reveal. But then you look at this book and you go, I mean, in one chapter, she covered everything from when she was born to when she got divorced in a chapter. Yeah. I just remember being like, what is she rushing through to get to here? Because I feel like she's missing the book. The entire book is her rushing through to make little jokes like, and then also my husband could fuck that country singer, wink, wink, barf, barf. Also, it, it reminds me of Anna Kendrick's book. Yeah. And that she takes tiny little stories and moments and gives you all the juice to like represent that time in her life. But when you walk away, you don't really have a sense of anyone. And I don't think it's because she's trying to be opaque. I just think she tried to focus on interesting little tidbits, which I don't know. She does say a lot of things straight up. She is very unfiltered and gives it to you straight and is like, here's what I get done. Here's the money. Here's how much it costs. Here's when we have sex, blah, blah, blah. I don't think she's capable of reflection. No, there's no reflection. I don't think she has a sense of self outside of like six feet tall, unfiltered, loves a Chardonnay. Yeah. And so throughout this book, it like, it's goofy and then it gets really old. (laughs) That being said, I mean, you can read it in about 25 minutes. Yeah. So the book starts, are you a vagina owner or gay? Then you'll want to read this book. Has your partner ever tried to convince you that you were just born with HPV? She (laughs) loves having HPV. And by that, I mean she hates it, but she brings it up a lot. Then you'll definitely want to read this book. Have you woken up one morning in a three-bedroom rental in Encino only to find your husband is now married to a washed-up country music singer and you're in the middle of a reality television meth controversy? You're going to want to pour yourself an extra large glass of Sauvignon Blanc because you're me. As a 40-year-old divorcee and single mom, I'm the first to admit that I don't have all the answers. Okay, this is the thing that like people who should not have written a book forget because they shouldn't have written a book is that no one is reading your book for like life advice for themselves. Especially not Brandy. But no one is coming to her. No one's coming to Chriselle. No one's coming to any of these people for answers. They're coming to you for like your story. I think like Lisa Vanderpump, people would be like, how do you have a perfect marriage and booming business and perfectly smooth face and she'd be like the answer is I married an old rich man I married an old rich man and I insist that they only blur me on my own tv show (laughs) like there are answers there to her perfect life yeah she does have that fat ass shout out Lisa Vanderpump (laughs) she keeps it thick and thin in the right places you know what I mean 
And the thing is, she acknowledges that she has no sense of self. Like, she talks about it a lot, but she never gets a sense of self. When I got divorced, I realized I had completely lost my sense of self. I had always identified myself as a number of nouns. Daughter, sister, girlfriend, model, friend, wife, mother, occasional amateur pharmacist. You get the point. I spent most of my life happy, just squeezing into someone else's ideas of the roles I should play. And so something funny about her, she's like, it was crazy. I had it all. I had a perfect marriage, perfect children, perfect house, perfect life. And then one day it came crumbling down. It's so crazy to think that my perfect marriage. I'm like, you have to stop calling it perfect if you now know he was cheating on you every day you breathed. (laughs) Also, she'll be like, there were times when there were signs. We were so happily married. How could I have known? There was one day that everything came crumbling down. Anyway, he would always have these business meetings in town where he'd have to spend the night. Also, I wasn't allowed to look at his computer or my own computer or anybody's phone. He actually insisted that I didn't know how to work any technology. She also was like, I mean, I had the handsome husband who would just give me a credit card and let me buy whatever I wanted. I did later find out that we were absolutely bankrupt. And the reason he met Leanne was because we had no money left. And I kind of knew it. And I told him he had to work or else we were going to lose everything. But besides those things, I had a perfect life and perfect home and perfect husband. The things being the cheating and the no money. The framing of the story changes with every chapter because sometimes it was a perfect marriage and sometimes she was sad and worried that he was cheating on her and like write about it. And then sometimes how could she have known until she got that one fateful text message? This book really does make no sense. (laughs) Silly mistakes can be fun and adventurous. It's also where my self-discovery happened. However, waking up in the VIP room of a Vegas strip club only to discover that I married my former best friend's ex-husband and tweeted it out to roughly 80,000 people is a story I'd sooner forget. She never even gets to that. She does not ever mention that again. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do or where you live. Everybody struggles from time to time. It's not the struggles that define you. It's how you overcome them. Among the many lessons I've learned, here are a few of my favorites. And then she talks about like how to know if your husband is cheating on you. And the thing is, I don't think she ever learns a single one of these lessons because she like had all of the answers before any of the mistakes were made. Like none of these are confusing things. Also, then she dates one other person. It seems like he was cheating on her the whole time, too. The truth is what you need to find Brandy is a man who will just cheat on you in a way that's respectful and quiet and keep you with the money because you don't really care if they're faithful. You just don't want to have to find out about it. Totally. So then she starts the book with the day that she found out her husband was cheating on her because it went live publicly because her husband, Eddie Siberian, was cheating on her with the country music singer Leanne Rhymes. And she says that if you discover your partner is cheating, drink like it's your last party, blame everyone else for your problems, let binging be your new favorite hobby, and by all means, fucking panic. This is such bad advice. She spends most of this book being like, listen, after you have a traumatic breakup, it's okay to have a two-year-long absolute mental breakdown. I think she's like trying to be funny, of course. Like this isn't genuine advice for real people, but it is such a weird thing to do to be like, yeah. Lose yourself completely. Get drunk every day. Get a DUI. That's what it's all about, baby. Like, just don't say that. Just say you did that. It's so weird to frame it as like life advice. So the day she finds out about the affair on TMZ, and I think that's really the difference, is she kind of had an idea. She said it was like, I had no idea. And then she backs it up a few months to when she went and met them on set and said, I know you're having an affair. And she's like, but when I said that, I was kidding. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, They happened to be going to Bruce Willis's wedding that weekend. So they ended up going away for the weekend anyway, because she says it had been months since they had gotten away, just the two of them. And I'm like, that's not that long of a time for parents of kids two under six. Yeah. Let's be clear. Eddie and I had an extremely healthy sex life, but every so often we would run away together so that we could make love in the middle of the afternoon as loud as we wanted, as long as we wanted. That coupled with an occasional lesbian makeout was the recipe for our seemingly successful marriage. And then she goes, I know what you're thinking. How is it okay for me to hook up with other women, but not my husband? No, that's not what I was thinking at all. I was thinking, why are you saying that it's the recipe for your successful marriage now that you know that it didn't work at all? Yeah, she is obsessed with the fact that she makes out with girls. She keeps calling herself a waste up lesbian. She's like, I appreciate a beautiful woman. I love to make out with them. Some of the things she says in this book, I'm like, no one asked. So why are you saying something insane? I guess I just think (laughs) if you're trying to like blow the lid off of how crazy Hollywood is. It's going to take a little bit more than I make out with girls every once in a while and my husband watches. I'm just like, yeah, you're adults. Who else would be doing that? And okay, one of the other insane things that she says that she does, which like, again, no one asked. And again, I don't think it's insane to make out with women. It's so weird the way she frames everything. And you're like, what are you talking about? But she talks about locking her baby in his room. 
So that's the other thing is I think her podcast persona is she's like the mom that tells it like it is. And she's like, you know, when your baby keeps getting out of his crib, so you put a lock on there, even though the fire department told you not to. Yeah, I think that that is her persona. I just really think that it's something that like, listen, if that's what you do, that's what you do. But like, don't tell people about it. I think it's hugely dangerous. The problem is she is somebody who is not smart, but she is very open. And every once in a while, she's open and honest in a way that is relatable and needed to be said. Like she has no shame. Throwing noodles at the wall, waiting to see what resonates with people. So she's throwing everything at the wall. And every once in a while, she says something like, oh, I was on Zoloft for postpartum depression. That is like breaking the barriers of shame. And I know as comedians, the number one punchline in the world is to say that you have HPV. If you have HPV, don't worry, everybody does. And if you don't have HPV, yes, you do. Everybody does. It's just like, (laughs) and I know that 10 years ago, things were less open this way. And I think it was probably helpful for someone to hear that Brandy has HPV and it it happens. It's not a big deal and it's fine. I don't think she's thoughtfully breaking boundaries of shame. I think she's been taught that the more outrageous and outlandish you are with like your exposés, the more money you can stand to make. So she's just She's not throwing spaghetti. She's throwing knives. And sometimes it's a bullseye and sometimes it like cuts people. Yeah. Okay. Like it's not smart to just be throwing knives around. (laughs) Totally. Especially with like two young kids. And also with like all of that filler. I don't know. I feel like if you don't have a sense of where your body begins and ends, you really shouldn't be sharp. So she goes to drop her kids off at school. She kisses Eddie goodbye. And that simple encounter was the last time they were really together. She gets a text on her way home from dropping her kids off at school and it is from a quote-unquote friend aka a total fucking hater the second wife of one of eddie's sleazy ass friends so she like goes in on this bitch who like sent her the perez hilton article and it's like for what can i say something that really comes clear is that she has no friends she has no friends and she's like i'm a really good friend i've always had so many friends i'm the most friend person ever but it's shocking that after the divorce it turned out i had no friends and she's like all these people that were the wives of eddie's friends It turns out none of them were my real friends. And I was like, I could have told you that. Anyway, this woman, an incredibly bored woman who broke up her current husband's previous marriage and resented that I was still close friends with his first wife, was all too eager to alert me to a story in Perez Hilton. I do feel like she's from this weird world. And it's not that weird, but it feels very specific of your clout is your husband. Your clout is your boyfriend. As a woman, you are like his walking shadow. Almost like the way dogs are. (laughs) You know how like Bug has friends and like you'll have a friend play date and then the dogs play together. Yeah. I mean, I know we live in a world where Bug is president, but in the real (laughs) world, Bug is your dog first and foremost. (laughs) I feel like that's how Brandy is about her husband. And she's like, I was still friends with this other dog because the owners were friends. (laughs) And I can't believe that this other dog whose old owner I was still friends with. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) <laughs> this dog who got rehomed, but I still knew her. <laughs> Yikes. Anyway, so she texted her and she freaks out. At first, this uncontrollable nervous laughter. And then suddenly, Eddie starts calling her frantically. One of the things that she does in this book that's really funny is the way she just like tramples on his career. She constantly will say, He is not a good actor. He's just so hot. And I am like, you're right. He's so hot. And then the other thing she does is she's like, okay, it all made sense why anyone gave a shit that he was cheating on me because who cares about Eddie Siberian? But it was because he was cheating with Leanne Rimes. And she's like, okay, the pieces are falling into place. People care about Leanne Rimes. Yeah. She was just like, why would we be front page news? Why would he? And she go, oh, it's her. Yeah. As I said, a little glass of water in the desert, baby. (laughs) Finally, a name with some oomph. (laughs) Uh, And then she gets like a little peek at her backstory. At 17 years old, she was discovered at a mall in Sacramento. And then she moved to Europe to be a model. I was told I was a body girl and didn't have the kind of face for beauty work. And then when she was in L.A. working, she met Eddie Siberian. He kind of swept her up right away. And then she just became a kept woman. Anyway, so it's a text about this Perez Hilton article that Eddie is cheating on her. She says, every so often, I would think that maybe he was cheating on me, but he never hesitated to call my insecurities and convince me how totally insane it was for me to question his total devotion to our family and me. I fell for it every time, hook, line, and sinker. And it's like, of course you did, because you wanted to. The lies that he could tell were astounding. I mean, could you ever convince your significant other that you caught HPV simply by sharing a lollipop with a colleague? I mean, no, unless my significant other wanted to believe that that's how I gave them HPV. 
I would confide to my concerns to my friends who would say, B, he adores you. You're crazy because you're all dogs. <laughs> they're not having fun without us. They're going to work. And when they come back, they're so happy to see us. <laughs> Everything they do is to take us to the park. How could you even question that? Isn't he interested in the sticks you bring him? <laughs> Doesn't he always give you snacks at 5 p.m.? Haven't you been such a good little girl? <laughs> I had a perfect life, so I chalked up the rumors to jealousy and decided all of my concerns were crazy. She goes, seriously, when would he even have the time? It seems like he's very unemployed, so I guess all... And they have a full-time nanny and a full-time housekeeper, and it seems like he was going on two to three boys' nights a week and often sleeping in L.A. where they lived at a hotel for work. So I guess, like, I can figure out when he had the time. It was, like, four to five nights a week. Every Tuesday, he slept in L.A. They lived in Calabasas. Also, he would, like, go film stuff on location for, like, a shitty direct-to-TV movie. But, like, he'd be gone for three months. So maybe then. She also says she's had to have three surgeries to remove cancerous cells caused by the HPV that he gave her. And that is sad. So anyway, he's like, by the way, there's an Us Weekly article. But uh, it's pretty innocent. It's of me and Leanne Rhymes getting dinner in Malibu. But it was like very friendly. And the only reason I lied to you about it was because I didn't want you to get mad about something innocent. Truth be told, I had already suspected for months. I recall when she sat across the dining room table from me telling me how hilarious Eddie was on set. Ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Siberian is many, many things, but humorous is not one of them. That's so funny. Can I tell you something? She hates him. I've been calling him Eddie Cipriani. Who's that? him in my head i guess it's eddie cibrian for some reason i say siberian i say cipriani to each their own pronunciation and i mean that for every name and and i really don't think his name is important because i don't think he's important totally he's mostly just a pair of dimples you know yeah he's mostly just like a beautiful man (laughs) he's got a face shaped like a foot in a way that works (laughs) in the best of ways just imagine a dimpled foot that you want to kiss Right on the heel. (laughs) A dimpled foot with a gorgeous tuft of hair (laughs) shooting right off the toe. Imagine instead of toes, it was hair. And on the side, there were dimples. And on the heel, there were lips. And you kissed those (laughs) lips. (laughs) That's Eddie Trippiani. She goes on to say how ugly Leanne Rhymes is. I'm a total waste up lesbian, but I didn't find her at all attractive. And she finds Leanne to be hugely inappropriate. So Leanne and Eddie were starring in a movie together and Brandy went to go visit and they're out to dinner with Leanne's husband, Dean. And then Leanne is blatantly hitting on Eddie the entire dinner, like trying to touch him. And she's like, well, I didn't think that they were actually fucking because every time she tried to touch him, he would squeeze my hand tighter to assure me that he wasn't going to fuck her while I was there. Except for when they went up and did I Got You Babe for karaoke. (laughs) And then at one point, they didn't realize Brandy was right behind them. And Leanne said, do you want to lick this icing off my boobs? And Eddie said, yeah. (laughs) And then Brandy was like, what is she talking about? She has no boobs. (laughs) Anyway, so she's like, there were clues that he was fucking Leanne Rhymes, But why would he? Because she's an uggo. Which she like throughout this entire book calls Leanne Rhymes like ugly and boring and not talented. And fat. And fat. She was still a bigger girl and completely flat chested at the time. Oh, God. He swore up and down that the story wasn't true, that it was just a string of disconnected photos that didn't tell the actual story. So they still go to the wedding in the Caribbean for Bruce Willis and Brandy's friend. And they have like one last weekend together where they just boink the whole time and it's romantic and it's lovely and their phones were turned off. And then they get back to L.A. and turn their phones on. And she's like, OK, based on the look on his face, these stories must be true. And then she sees the story and it is like photos of them making out and she's like okay so it was true well now us weekly had posted surveillance footage from the restaurant where eddie and leanne had dinner so it's no longer just photos of them having dinner but it's like video of them making out and sucking each other's fingers (laughs) at a restaurant (laughs) maybe he had something stuck under his nail and the only way to get it out is with suction have you ever eaten avocado and quinoa with just your hands (laughs) no (laughs) well it would get under your nails and someone would have to suck it out So they're in an airport and she's like hysterically crying. Eddie went to D.C. and he was like, goodbye. The moral of the story couldn't be clearer. You already know if your partner is fucking around behind your back. You just need to decide if you're done being a doormat. You need to wake up one morning and decide that those rose colored glasses are so last fucking season. This is the thing is she didn't decide that. Like the decision was made for her because 
He wouldn't stop fucking Leanne Rhymes. <laughs> First, she was like, I'll take you back if you stop. And he was just like, no, and I don't want to come back. And then the Sheena Shea of it all came out. The thing is, he was cheating on her a lot. This list is crazy. If you have questions about your partner's fidelity, here are my top five signs that he's cheating. One, he has two cell phones and no job. Two, he showers before going to the gym. Three, your partner all of a sudden requires a lot more me time, especially if your partner is Eddie Cibrian. That man has more me time than most single guys. Four, local business meetings never require an overnight stay. Never. Everyone already, who would not know these things? Five, his credit card bills and cell phone bills go to his parents' house. Oh, Brandy. So she also ends every chapter with Brandy's babble, which is one of the most babbling things I've ever seen. She says, Brandy's babble. Before you judge the girl with the broken ankle, walk a mile in her stiletto. What are you talking about, Brandy? What does that have to do with anything? The thing about this book is that I do see some people I know in this book when I'm like, who would act like this? I am like, oh, I do know exactly who. And it is a lot of members of our society who are told that like, if you just be pretty and say yes all the time, then like, why won't that man just be your husband? (laughs) (laughs) It's so true. If you're like, but I was so hungry for six years and I completely diminished all of myself. Why wasn't that enough for you? She's being what she thinks is the most transparent, but this isn't the most trans. Like the honest truth of it is her being like, I don't understand why I couldn't keep a D-list actor by just like being as hot as I possibly could. What more was there? I guess it's like when you're talking to a little kid and they're like, I want blue, I want red, I want green. And you're like, what they're saying is their truth in the moment. But it's not the truth. Yeah. The truth is they have a cold coming on and they're a little bit grumpy and they don't know how to express it to you that their body feels weird, but they don't know why. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I do feel like the most tea-filled part of this book was the details of the divorce, which were crazy. She really gives it all. Eddie took her for a fucking ride. Yeah. That's not nice. Well, in California, I guess everything is split down the middle. And the problem here was that He was not making that much money. So her alimony was based off of his income, but his income was dwindling and he was married to a rich person. So he like played it smart. He played it smart. Basically, she's like, there was no impetus for him to like work hard and make money because half of it went to me and he could just live off of her. The other thing is that he really worked to make sure she got as little as possible. Like everything gets split down the middle, but I think you can like volley for assets or whatever. And he wanted her to get screwed. That is like one of the only vulnerable moments in this book is when she's like, I really just couldn't figure out why. Like, I don't understand why he was so angry at me when he's the one who cheated and then also wouldn't even come back. Yeah. It is weird to be like, I hate you so much because I left you for another woman. He like doesn't want her to get the car that her dad gave them that she wanted to like fix up and give back to her dad as a gift. There are a couple little things where I'm like, I don't know if you're just giving us your side of the story here, but if this is true... That is so fucked. She says, in spite of everything, the one thing I never understood, after 13 years and two children, this man was intent on ruining me. Yeah, it's bizarre because she is the mother of his children, but she's always like, I didn't have a job. I didn't worry about the finances. I didn't check the computer. I didn't know anything because my job was to look hot, be a trophy wife, and have dinner on the table. I do wonder if she ever had dinner on the table. I mean, I don't think she did. She was a housekeeper and a nanny. (laughs) But still, here's something wild. And ladies, learn from her. Learn from this. But raising his children, I discovered, offered me zero insurance when it came to the divorce. In all of our years of marriage, I did not have my name on a single document. Not for any of the homes we purchased, not for one of the cars or motorcycles, every credit card, every power bill, every medical statement was in my husband's name. Even the vintage Bronco my father had given us to refurbish was in Eddie's name. In 13 years, I had built precisely zero credit. I had zero savings. And now I was about to become a single mom. Also, their divorce cost $250,000 because they argued on everything. And she says that she like was not raised rich, so she knew how to not be rich. But I was like, well, that's obviously not true because you are very comfortable living beyond your means with Eddie Cibrian. I had no idea we had money problems besides the fact that his mom, who was our money manager, would say, you're spending too much money, Brandy. (laughs) She also says for a minute they tried to make it work and they went to a couples counselor. But then she found out about his second affair, which was with a cocktail waitress named Sheena Shea, baby. (laughs) She also says... But can I say she says worm to the word worm to the wise (laughs) plug worm to the wise. If you see a couple's therapist, your marriage is probably already over. Like 
The thing is, I wish that she was just saying stuff and not trying to like turn it around and give it back as advice. Because even though I don't think that's true, I think you can go to couples counseling and save your marriage if you want to. I agree. It just has to be before your husband has like, in her own words, fucked every cocktail waitress in Los Angeles. Then she says, in actuality, I ended things. He would have come back if I let him, but that wasn't an option. I would never be able to look at him the same way again. But then later she's like, well, after I found out about Leanne, I would have let him come back. But then I found out about Sheena Shea. But then it sounds like she's like, yeah, when we were in the house trying to work it out, he was living in his own bedroom and leaving for days at a time to be with Leanne and turned out he was fucking her the whole time. And also like they immediately got married. And also I couldn't get him to give her up. So I'm like, what do you mean? Was he just saying I want to be with you and then fucking you and then driving to see Leanne and saying I'm going to marry you soon? Yes. I don't really think it was up to you. She also is obsessed with being like, you don't understand. We had the perfect life. Everybody was jealous of us. Everybody was so jealous of us because I had the credit card and I had the body and I had the hot husband and my hot husband was like the most famous of all of our friends and we were rich in LA. But then also she's like, in LA, everybody's so rich and we had so little compared to everybody. I'm like, there's no way that you were of the mindset that you had the most famous husband of your friend group. Especially when your best friend just married Bruce Willis. That's such a good point. She was being like, I had the most successful husband out of my friends, except for my one friend who was married to Bruce Willis. She also is constantly saying that Eddie Cibrian is a terrible actor who wasn't that famous. And then she's also being like, You know, we had it all compared to everybody else. But then also $20,000 is a lot of money to us. Like he barely made any and it turned out we were living beyond our means. I guess I don't know what she's ever talking about. And I can't believe that this book had a co-writer because like, what were they doing here? I think there is a way to be like, we had a lot. I took a lot of pride in the appearance of our beautiful relationship and having all this sex and being so skinny and having two little boys and having a big house. But the reality was there was always more to be had and it was like a keeping up with the Joneses race on the treadmill kind of thing. But every single paragraph in this book contradicts itself. I don't regret the life we built together. I just regret encouraging him to do that made for TV movie. Like she keeps on acting like if he had never done that movie, then the relationship never would have fallen apart. But then she's like, I was the one who wouldn't take him back. But also he wouldn't come back to me. But then also when I found out about the other waitress, but then it turned out he had fucked half of Hollywood. But then also if it hadn't been for this one movie, we would have never would have broken up. I guess the thing is that when he was having sex with cocktail waitresses, he was just like cheating on his wife. And then when he met Leon Rimes, he was like, I think we would have a better life together and we should leave our partners for each other. And I bet you with Leanne, he is still sleeping with other people, but like he has not and probably will not meet someone that he would rather have a life with. She probably wouldn't have left him because it, how could she have not known that he was fucking a lot of other people? I guess what they had in common is that they both wanted a fancy looking life. Yeah. And the problem was for a while, having a hot, tall wife made him look more fancy. But what actually would make him look more fancy was access to a private jet. Yeah. And then the other thing is he, it seems like, was actually working kind of hard to support his family because he was a pretty D-list actor. And so if he could just like take the financial burden off of himself and, you know, move up to the C-list for a minute like that is really awesome to him, I think. (laughs) Anyway, so then she goes back to her origin story during her senior year of high school. She got scouted by a modeling agent. She lived in Sacramento. She went into San Francisco for a meeting and they were like, you're going to Europe, baby. And that's kind of all we get about her childhood, except for that on that first trip to Europe, she found out she was afraid of flying. And so she had to roofie herself on the plane. She also keeps saying she grew up in the ghetto, which is... She uses the word ghetto a lot in hashtags and in sentences. She grew up with not a lot of money. Her dad like dealed weed. But also it sounds like that was one of three jobs. So it sounds like that was a side hustle Mm -hmm. more than anything. But she's one of three kids. She has a good relationship with her parents. They're still together. The interesting divorce stuff was that I guess the Bronco was something they really fought over. And so the mediator had them do this thing where they each were supposed to write down how much they would pay to buy the other one out. And the person who wrote down the higher number won. And so she fooled him by looking like she was writing a long ass number and he wrote 65,000 and she wrote $1. So then she was like, well, fuck it. I'll take the 65K over the Bronco. That's really funny. She also still had a point of writing the $70,000 engagement ring. And she's like, yeah, I guess it would have saved me a lot of financial hardship if I had just sold it. But I wanted to keep it for one of my boys to use. And she's like, anytime someone points out that it might be bad luck that I give them my broken ring from my broken marriage, I say, shut up. And I'm like, I don't know. I would not want your mom's like divorce ring. Yeah. Me either. Especially because Leanne could buy them such a better ring. Yeah. (laughs) So then she talks about traveling when she was a model in Europe. She thinks that it's a great experience for any young lad. The experience gifted me a sense of awareness that proved helpful during my breakup and subsequent early midlife crisis. I mean, what sense of awareness? She loved traveling. She met so many people. She got really into food and dating. 
Dude, this is like the most horrific line in the whole book. Six years after I moved to Europe, I went back to LA to shoot a Coors Light commercial and ended up at an obnoxious club. I saw Eddie Sabirian across the room. I couldn't keep my eyes off him. It was love at first sight or perhaps lust. Yes, we slept together that first night. I'd never endorse sleeping with someone you just met because half the fun is in the challenge, but man, it was fucking hot. I used to joke that he raped me. Rape jokes are never funny except when they are. I was saying no, no, no the entire time, but we all know that despite the adage, sometimes no does mean yes. Bitch, there are some things you could just not write down. So then she goes, he asked me to stay in Los Angeles. He didn't want me to travel for work anymore. So I did. I just stayed in Los Angeles. Then we moved in together and we're crazy in love. Hashtag Beyonce said it best. I would have done anything for that man. Five years later, we were married. I decided to forego traveling for modeling entirely. My husband wanted to start a family. She says a few times that she was perfectly comfortable being a kept woman, and I believe that. I think that she would have been fine to do that for the rest of her life. Yeah, she was. It's like, he told me I wasn't allowed to use the computer, and I like that he told me what to do. It was very hot. But do you see what I mean in the pacing of when I was 19, I moved to Europe, and then when I was 23, I met Eddie, and then we got married five years later. I'm like, what is this book about then? If that's the part that we're rushing through for context and like preamble, then what is this book about? I don't know. So after the divorce, she is not doing well financially because she is not getting a lot of money from Eddie and she has never worked except for when she was a model in Europe or whatever. One of my closest friends actually suggested that I become an exotic dancer. She couched it by saying that since I might be too old to make a consistent living modeling, I should at least make some money off my great ass. And then she like talks about how she considered it. And then she hires a publicist instead and tries to become just like a public persona. And she does because of the way that this has kind of thrown her into the tabloids. She starts making money doing appearances. She also seems like an idiot when it comes to money. She can't even sign for a car because she has no credit. So her parents help co-sign for her. And she gets like the most expensive car. She gets a Range Rover Sport. I was jobless, homeless, mother of two, living out of her $1,200 a month SUV and couch surfing from one hospitable friend to the next. So then she's like talking to the press all the time about her divorce because she kind of likes that she has more of a name now. She's like becoming a bit of a tabloid fixture. And then she goes radio silent. She's like, actually, I think this is so bad for me. I shouldn't do it. Well, what really happens is she calls Eddie an absentee father and he cuts off her credit card. Yeah. So she starts learning that in order to make nice, she has to like stop talking shit about them publicly. But then she starts getting offered money for these interviews. And then she starts making money doing appearances. She starts developing kind of a following. She starts making some money and she's able to rent a house for her boys. She says she's making $10,000 in appearance. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I am like, wait, that's a shit ton of money. I'm sorry. You can work like a couple weekends a month. (laughs) One weekend a month and make 120K. I was finally able to start to build my own credit pay my own bills and figure out ways to get by month to month. It was insanely gratifying. I'm not necessarily proud of the means that I used, but I'm not ashamed of my actions either. It wasn't ideal, but I did what I had to do in order to make ends meet given the options available. It was a hell of a lot better than stripping. I mean, as Claire Parker famously said, the things bitches will do to not ever be a waitress. (laughs) It is crazy that she's like, I either have to like exploit my personal life publicly for appearance fees or I have to be a stripper. There is no in between. The way that it really is like, well, unless I'm making enough money to support my Range Rover habit, I'd rather not work at all. Go get a job at the mall, bitch. I don't know. (laughs) Work your way up. You could be a manager at the makeup counter at Macy's in no time, I'm sure. (sighs) So this next chapter is about how women are backstabbing bitches. (laughs) This is what's so uninteresting about her and this whole fucking book is that not a lick of interrogation goes into anything she's ever thought. There's two truths when it comes to girlfriends. They can be the absolute best and they can be the absolute worst. The difference is if you're a good friend, you can be totally envious of your friend's fabulous purchase or new job, but also be genuinely happy for him or her. Unfortunately, in La La Land, these kinds of real friends are few and far between, in my experience at least. I had it all. I had the hot husband who had somehow managed to develop a modicum of celebrity. I had a beautiful six-bedroom home in Calabasas and was a stay-at-home mom with two gorgeous little boys. I had wonderful little friends who were there to help me at the drop of a hat. I had a limitless credit card and a husband who never questioned a single bill. I thought I'd won the life lottery. How could this be true when you also know that you guys had money problems and you also are now realizing that none of your friends were real and also... He was cheating on you. You knew in some part of you that he was cheating on you the whole time. So then she goes on to say there's three kinds of friends. There's the friends that hit the road the minute the party ends. There's the friends that'll pretend to be your friend, but then really don't have what it takes to stick it out. And then there's those who won't budge, friends for life. These are the men and women that I cherish. Rain or storm, they will always be there. 
And she goes, four years ago, I would have been certain that almost all my friends would have fallen into that third category. I would have bet my life on it. So then she goes into explaining the way that her friends kind of like fell off when she was going through her divorce. Some of them, it seems like we're just excited to like watch her in her lowest moments. Some were there for the dinners where she cried if she was paying for the dinner, but very few people offered to take care of her back. I do think if you develop friendships with the dynamic of, well, I'm the rich one that pays for things, then the friends that you're going to court in that part of your life are the ones that are going to be here while you pay for things. Yeah. I also think if your friendships consist of your husband is friends with my husband, when you lose your husband, you're going to lose your friends. It turns out I should have listened to my gut. It's so funny the way she talks about friendships versus romantic relationships. Once you realize a friend is only looking out for himself or herself, you need to be able to cut your losses and walk away. Well, what about when you find out your husband is definitely cheating on you? Well, then you have to find out again a second time. And then a third time, perhaps. And then say, you have to stop cheating on me with that one. And if he says no, then I guess it's time you walk away. (laughs) It's time to go. (laughs) During the divorce of yet another close friend, I was by her side for the entire roller coaster and again moved her into my guest room. Is very much sure that she is the greatest friend and she cannot believe that all of her great friendship has not been reciprocated. And this, dear Brandy, I also would love you to look at closely because you also were sure you were in a great marriage. She never finds a fault with herself. And obviously, like the Eddie thing isn't her fault, but I am like realizing that your entire life was a lie. You never stopped and looked at how could I have been living such a lie and had no idea. I mean, even when she gets a DUI, she's like, the lesson I learned is only drink sometimes. <laughs> and then she's like, anyway, I was dating this guy and I was a couple of drinks in when I went to meet him. And I'm like, oh my God, you'll never stop drinking and driving. So one of her best friends, or so she thought, had broken up with one of Eddie's good friends. But then the friend is reconciling with Eddie's friend and in reconciliation starts becoming friends again with Eddie and Leanne. And Brandy cannot believe that this like best friend of hers is hanging out with Leanne now. And she says, as much as I hold my friend accountable for the demise of our relationship, in the back of my head, I knew it was somehow Leanne's doing. She had everything else in my life, so why wouldn't she want all my friends? I mean, can I say, Leanne was not after your life. Like, she was after your hot husband. He, it seems like, had these friendships where all his friends had (laughs) dog-wise. And so they came with the territory. Yeah, because they'd sniffed and they peed and it was their territory now. (laughs) Now he's a dog-wife and they live at a bigger dog park. That's where everyone goes to hang out. Losing these women was a blessing in disguise. Their absence allowed me to fully appreciate the handful of extremely loyal friends who have stuck by my side. And then she goes on to say, it was the million dollar question for today's world of tabloid celebrity breakups. What do you do when you see paparazzi photos of your friend's ex with his or her new partner? Which is, I think, the question many of us ask. Totally. I actually do think it's relevant. Like when you see your friend's ex back on Tinder or whatever, you're like, do I tell him? No. And let me tell you, Brandy finds that too. She says, don't send me pictures of my ex-husband's new wife. Because I've already seen him, she says. (laughs) And then she also says, you also have to watch out for complaining too much. You have to be able to read the signs. When they no longer pick up on the first ring or when all their responses and advice have become less sympathetic, it's time to reevaluate how much you're leaning on one particular person. It's not because these people don't love you. It's because they have their own shit going on. Which I found weirdly astute. (laughs) Yeah, aware. So I think your friends are there for you, but I do think there has to be an awareness that if you have like a prolonged situation like this divorce that went on for two years and is obviously going to take a really long time to get over. People can't talk about it all the time. Well, it's just like also you have to understand that in two years, somebody else is going to go through something at some point. Yeah. And there needs to be room for that. I think you can have like a month or so of like nonstop you, but at some point you need to get a coffee and say, and has something gone on with you recently? Brandy's babble. There are two kinds of friends to avoid at all costs. Wannabes and former child stars. I don't think she ever remembers what she was talking about. She constantly refers to Leanne as this like washed up former child star, which like, I don't know, man. It would be fine if she also didn't spend the other half of this book talking about how she's completely over it all. And how she needs to learn how to get along. I mean, the problem is at point of recording, not point of book, they've now been married for 13 years. They beat you. Brandy. They he actually did like her a lot better than you. Oh, God. So then she goes into a chapter about pharmaceuticals, which, you know, I think, like you said, is one of the things that when she overshares about could be helpful to people. So she suffered from postpartum depression after the birth of her second son, and she was really struggling. She said she would just go to Target every day and cry. And she knew that there was something wrong. 
but she didn't know what to do. And she's like, it's not your fault if something's wrong, but it is your fault if you don't help yourself, especially when you have other children. And so one day she found herself like screaming at her toddler unfairly. And she was like, I have to get a handle on this now. And she went on Lexapro and she said within two weeks, she felt back to her old self and she fucking hates Tom Cruise for going up against Brooke Shields and how dare a man who's never experienced labor or birth or being a young mother sit there and on his high horse and tell women about what they're feeling, which say it again is so fucking true. And then she says everybody acts like it's such a big deal to be on antidepressants, even though everybody in L.A. is on them. So there should be no shame. If you need help, get help. She also went on Lexapro again when she was going through her divorce because she wanted to be able to be there for her kids. The one habit I did need to sideline was my drinking. After my divorce, even with the help of Lexapro, I fell into a bit of a tailspin. I mean, this whole book is kind of a tailspin. She also is like, yeah, it took me two years to have sober sex. I call wine my rape juice, like oh, grape God. juice. And I'm like, you've got to stop making these rape jokes. I don't love them. And then also she says, you know, it took me two years of having a breakdown before I got it together. But that's like a very reasonable amount of time. I think two years is a good barometer for anyone going through any kind of major change, whether it's divorce, death, illness, a new job, a new home or a new relationship. After 24 months, most of the dust should have settled. That's like a really long time. That's like a really long time. And you can't just be like, Oh, uh, how much time did it take me to get over something? That sounds like exactly the right amount of time. Some of these things, I'm not going to tell you how long it takes to get over death. I'm not going to tell I don't know what kind of illness you have. If you have the flu, I don't think it should take two years to recover. You can't just be like blacking out in your home. Being like, I had the flu in 2022. <laughs> April. So I've got three more months of figuring my shit out. But I will say, if you have a new job, you absolutely should not be taking two years to wait for the dust to settle. What does that even mean? Two years. I mean, Ashley went through like a job a year for a while. Like that is, you should be at your second job in two years. Two years. You should be seven jobs deep. You should have cried about a promotion four times by now. <laughs> Imagine being at your one year review and then being like, and, and how do you think things are going? You're like, good. I am halfway to getting a good sense of the lay of the land. I'm almost ready to start checking my email. <laughs> it's just so crazy that she like very openly admits that she has an alcohol dependency and then is like, anyway, I drink sometimes. <laughs> she goes, I'm well aware that it sounds like I was an alcoholic and maybe I was, but the booze wasn't my problem. It was the pain under the booze. And we're like, yeah, of course. Duh. That's like always what it is. Brandy's babble, take a fucking cab. And then we get into her vag rejuve surge. I've never been coy about my vanity. I just never expected to find myself at Dr. Matlock's office. But my life's journey has shifted and I decided to shift with it. Can you believe his name sounds so much like Meat Locker and he's chopping up puss? <laughs> he's locking up the meat. I wonder if he keeps the extra somewhere. <laughs> Anyway, so she had a traumatic moment where after her two babies, she was concerned that her vagina wasn't the same. And then one time her and Eddie got into a huge fight because he used to take Propecia because he was worried about his hairline receding. Because he didn't want the toes of his foot face to be looking <laughs> bald and toeish. So he starts taking Propecia, but it makes his foot peen not be able to get hard. Yeah, the penis of his foot head. <laughs> She screams at him about it. And then he's like, well, your vagina is looser than a goose. This is the one thing that she will not quote. She's like, I can't even tell you what he said. It was so vulgar. And I'm like, tell us, Brandy. You just called his current wife fat and flat. What did he say about your vagina? She's like, it wasn't as bad as a hot dog down a hallway, but it was close. A hot dog down a small well, a family, <laughs> private, personal, like not a village well, a personal well. A well that you wouldn't drown if you fall down. but A hot dog in a thermos. But you could starve down there. And then when they were breaking up, he was living in a guest room in their house. And they were just having these like knockdown drag out fights where they would scream and then they would have sex and they would scream and they would have sex. And one time she was like, I can't have sex with him again. And she really Nicki minaj it. Like, if you ain't fuck me, you fuck the old body. Yeah. If you ain't fuck Nikki, you fuck Nicole body. She decides that she is going to get a new vagina and then have it be a vagina that Eddie has never fucked. And that to her is like healing. And so she goes for this, you know, upgrade meeting and it's $12,000 and she charges it to Eddie. She has her mom do like a little diary entry of what it was like to take care of Brandy after the surgery. And it seems like it was excruciating. She said it was the worst pain she'd ever felt. She got in a boob job and didn't feel anything. And this felt like her vagina was on fire. They kept like removing the catheter and putting it back in because she's like, something is just wrong here. She said she wanted to crawl out of her skin. It sounded awful, but hey, after a week, she was able to get back up and out. And uh, she said it works. It's a brand new and she loves the sensation. 
So that's nice, I guess. You know, props to her for being open about it. I, to each their own, I say. Eddie's dad, who she was very close to, I guess, during their marriage, drove her. And I'm just like, God, I cannot imagine calling my husband's father and being like, can you drive me to my post-divorce new pussy procedure? <laughs> <laughs> Brandy's babble. Ultimately, my husband got a new vagina, and so did I. A wink. So then she talked about social media. She was not on social media before her divorce. She didn't even really know how to work a computer because Eddie liked it that way. And then when she discovered it, listen, this was actually kind of relatable. She got pretty addicted to it because Leanne Rhymes was very into sharing updates on her Twitter. So Brandy was like obsessively stalking her Twitter and just like intensely addicted to knowing everything that they were up to at all times. In the 13 years plus we were together, he never wanted to be near a computer. I liked having my man tell me what to do. It was hot. But now she's divorced and she needs to figure out how to work a computer. And she had a really hard time. (laughs) She, however, does not entirely subscribe to the idea of Tweehab, which is when you go to rehab for being addicted to your phone. And to you, I say, I don't know, Brandy. I may need Tweehab. And then she goes, I can totally relate to those who feel social media has taken over their lives, but cyber rehab, really? If you have the kind of money to check yourself into therapy because you can't stop tweeting, go buy a fucking plane ticket to Maui and take a vacation instead. For those people with pre-existing dependencies and addictive personalities, it can be especially dangerous. And if that's the case, seeking medical treatment to help conquer those demons is commendable. I just don't believe that regular people need treatment just because they can't stop refreshing their news feeds. If they were regular people, they wouldn't need rehab. Like, yeah, I don't like know what if, she's Yeah, if you about. have a regular relationship to your phone, then you don't have an addicted relationship to your phone. <sighs> also, later, she goes to a hypnotist to help her with face picking. And I'm like, okay, Brandy. <laughs> so you need somebody to hack your subconscious so that you'd leave your blackheads alone. But yeah. <laughs> somebody who can't get off their phone is so crazy. The reason she originally gets on social media is because she wants to, first of all, stalk her ex. And second of all, make Leanne and, you know, Eddie jealous and make it seem like she's doing really well. And at first, she considers leaking nudes of herself because she wants Eddie to be like, wow, all these other guys are jacking off to my ex-wife. Maybe I want her back. (laughs) And then her friend talks her out of it. And I'm like, okay, so you did have at least one good friend. And then she decides to just get on Facebook and post updates that make her life look really fun. And that's how she'll get back at Eddie. And Eddie, like, kind of didn't care. I started posting trampy, drunk photos of my gorgeous girlfriends and me dancing in Barbie doll-sized dresses at Las Vegas nightclubs or lounging on tropical beaches wearing barely their bikinis. I was desperate to send my notoriously jealous ex-husband into green with envy tailspin. I have to admit, I put up a fantastic front. To anyone looking, I was having the time of my life. This is very Crystal Hefner coded of being like, you would have never believed it. You wouldn't have ever known. But having sex with the dead Hugh Hefner was not good. (laughs) I was hooked. Facebook was my life. You would have never guessed it. But as a 38-year-old mother of two with a brand new vagina that I went through excruciating hell to achieve when I was partying at a nightclub in Vegas, I actually wasn't that happy. (laughs) What? No. <laughs> what? what? There are a screech. <laughs> doggy, doggy, what now? <laughs> and then this part is crazy. She talks about getting involved in Twitter. I still haven't totally mastered the Twitterverse. It took me more than two years to get this far, but I did discover pretty quickly how to find Leanne's Twitter page. Twitter felt impossible. Like, what the fuck is a hashtag? How the hell do I retweet? I mean, listen, original Twitter, all you could do was type 140 characters and press send. My only regret now is that I didn't hop on the technology bandwagon sooner. Okay. Uh, then she says it's so fun to check where your ex is on Foursquare, RIP. She gripes that social media has ruined the concept of a blind date. Because now if he's married, it's so easy to figure it out. Oh, she says that cyberbullying isn't real, which is an insane thing to say, especially for a real housewife. She's like, listen, it doesn't affect your real life. I would love to check the tape on her. Yeah. When you open up your life via social media and allow random people to interact with you, you can't get upset if someone in middle America wants to call you fat, ugly, or perhaps a homewrecker. Who's calling her a homewrecker? Oh, I guess at this point, she was accused of cyberbullying Leanne. Oh. She's like, um, that's not even real. Just turn off your phone, idiot. You fat, ugly, homewrecking idiot. <laughs> And I bet she's changed her tune on that because I bet she has gotten bullied pretty mercilessly on those apps. Yikes. And she says, so if you choose to be an active member of the cyber world, here are my rules for being responsible. Oh, God. Do not allow yourself to be victimized by shitty people. You got to know when to fold them, which means that if you're on the receiving end of offensive tweets, just turn off your computer. Don't be a fucking hypocrite. Oh, Brandy. I will say this one makes me laugh. 
everybody has seen a sunset. Nobody wants to see a picture of a sunset you saw. And if you're lame enough to want to see someone else's photo of a sunset, guess what? Go outside at 6 p.m. and watch the sun motherfucking set. That's such a good point. I forgot that like, okay, not everybody can just go eat avocado toast whenever they want. But the sun is free to you and to me. And it sets literally every day. So if you miss it today, you could catch it tomorrow. I never check on the sun. Sometimes it's there and then it's gone. And I say, fuck, did anyone take a photo of the sunset? This next chapter is about raising kids in a post-divorce world. Ew, I just saw what it was called. Yeah. My favorite threesome. Ew. (laughs) Is that about her two boys or is that about like co-parenting? I don't know. This chapter is honestly about her being like, I don't know, I was so mad at their dad, but I'm trying to like make them not hate him and they can figure out what happened later and hate him on their own terms. She's like, the most shocking day of my life was when my older son Mason asked me if cheaters go to hell. And she goes, Ugh, the gossip mill must have trickled down to his classmates at school about what was going on with their father. And I'm like, yes, it was definitely that. And not the fact that you were like locked in your room for a week with getting a new vagina. It's not the fact that you and your husband were screaming at each other constantly. It's not the fact that like, you were on your computer and it was everywhere and you were often buying magazines with Eddie Cibriani, cheater on the cover. Like this idea that they had no idea what's going on when Brandy is famously like the least controlled, most impulsive, insane person. She's like, I walked around the house with sunglasses on for months because I couldn't stop crying. She just said that she was blacked out for two years. And then she's like, how did you know that me and your dad were breaking up? (laughs) What sick mom told you? (laughs) She talks about how she doesn't want to talk shit about Leanne in front of them because she's like, they'll get to know that she's a real bitch on their own. (laughs) I'm sure they don't know that you hate her. And she goes, listen, those boys, they got me through this because without them, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed in the morning. And then she goes, but if you don't have kids, that's way better because then at least you get to never see your ex again. So she talks about how for two years, Mason slept in her bed whenever they were staying with her because he could tell that she like needed him to cuddle with her. And then after he got too old to sleep in his mom's bed, the little one came and slept in her bed and still does sometimes. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus Christ. Boy moms, am I right? They had a real problem with spoiling their kids to try to win their favor. And I don't know if they ever stopped. She's just like, we both knew it was wrong, but we wanted them to like us best. She was like, I knew I was in over my head when I said we're going to visit grandma and grandpa. And they said, cool, are we flying private? Leanne would buy them everything under the sun and I wanted to go tit for tat or how about tit for tit since she went out and got my exact fucking boob job. How many boob jobs are there? Isn't it just like a binary? You have boob job or you don't have boob job? I think there's like three boob jobs. But I don't think anybody's looking and going saline versus what's the other one? Jello? I feel like you can get them like natural but big, like bigger than what is actually natural. You know what I mean? Like a normal big boob. And then you can get like those rock hard 90s boobs. And then you can get those like big old bags. I want someone to grab me and say, you feel like a stress ball. (laughs) I'm stressed. Let me grab your boobs. Luckily, Eddie and I have done a fairly good job of shielding the boys from a lot of the douchebaggery that comes with Los Angeles. I mean, how do you know? Because at this point, they were like nine and six. Imagine being like, luckily, I raised someone who's not an asshole. Anyway, he's about to turn 10. She also like got in huge trouble for calling her kids assholes. (laughs) They went through a legal battle about whether or not she could get her kids on Real Housewives, did she? I guess so, because later in the book, she says that she got in trouble for letting her kid pee on the lawn. Oh, yeah. She was like, me and Eddie both came from very humble beginnings. I was from the ghetto. And similarly, Eddie's dad was a banker and his mom was an office manager. And I'm like, okay, that sounds quite middle class. I think we can all agree that Los Angeles is one of the most difficult cities in the world to raise normal, grounded children. Well, I don't know that we'd all agree She also is like, I'm the better parent because I'm the one who's more likely to talk to our kids about sex. Eddie doesn't tell our kids anything about sex and they're already eight. And then she's like, plus, I won't even let my kids leave the house because I'm scared that they'll get molested. So I'm always explaining molestation to them because I care. Do you think Eddie's telling them about the way that child predators might want to rape them? No, (laughs) never. And then she goes on and on about how hard it is to raise kids in L.A. because they all have expensive birthday parties. But then she's like, actually raising kids in L.A. is good because they can play baseball all year round. So I don't know. You know what she's talking about here when she says, some of you may have heard about a $50,000 Mad Hatter themed birthday party for a four-year-old girl thrown by one particular Beverly Hills housewife. You know what was in those goodie bags, Ashley? Is that the Barbie Rocks birthday? Absolutely. None other than Taylor Armstrong. Oh, my God. The next chapter is about co-parenting, and it is titled His Future X, which... You know, not yet, but maybe someday. I would like to pretend that she doesn't exist. I've never been the biggest country music fan, so it's not like I ever stumble across her songs on the radio. 
I would love to believe that when my children aren't sleeping under my roof, they're in their best friend's house or fully vetted and safe at a spa retreat for children. So she hates having to co-parent with Leanne, but she does believe that Eddie is miserable in his new marriage. So that helps. I mean, (laughs) like I said, 10 years later, they're still going strong, but you know, he could be miserable. The pictures can be hard to see, especially the shots of her with my children. See my ex-husband's new wife playing bonus mom to my babies. The boys I gave birth to was an absolute gut punch, but even worse was seeing her inappropriately hanging all over Eddie, wearing virtually nothing while my children were nearby watching. When she sent me these inappropriate text messages about her desire to mother my kid, I responded as most level-headed mothers would. Listen, bitch, you barely have my husband. I will kill you before you get your hands on my children. I will say that it does seem fucked up to me that they didn't want the kids appearing on Real Housewives when Leanne and Eddie like were seemingly posting them all over social media and like parading them in front of the paparazzi. Where was the text that Leanne sent her? I don't think she included it. But it was something about how she's like so excited to help raise the kids and like take them to school and make their lunches and stuff. Yeah. I would love to see the text. I wonder if she couldn't post it because it was just so reasonable. (laughs) What if she's just like, hey, Brandy, I just like want to let you know that when they're here, like I will try my best to be the best stepmom to your kids and show them love. And I guess the thing is, she does have every right to be like, fuck that hoe. Because the other thing is, Leanne was blatantly fucking your husband and like flirting with him in front of you while you guys were still together. No, I mean, fuck Leanne. Like, fuck Leanne. But also, at this point, Leanne is now married to your ex and like parenting your kids. You can't end in the chapter where you're saying, I understand that getting along with her is best for co-parenting my children and that's why I curse her out and don't speak to them. They do not speak. She is not even allowed to talk to Eddie. It's all done through assistant. And so it seems like now, 10 years later, things are fairly neutral between them all. But it's so crazy for her to be like, I insisted that we go to a mediator because we had to all be able to co-parent well. And that dumb, washed up country bitch was spending time with my children. Like, this book is going to come out, Brandy. She has nice skin. That's the one compliment I can offer her, if forced. I'm assuming she spends lots of time getting facials. But the amount of foundation she plasters on her face is obscene. She once arrived at a school performance with a full face of thick, caked on makeup, a whole strip of false eyelashes. A perfect blowout in five-inch heels. Anyone who's insecure enough to rock that look at eight in the morning for a grammar school at Thanksgiving play has a boatload of issues. All three of us needed to check our egos at the door if we were (laughs) going to be good guardians to these two little boys. Okay. So they end up going to therapy and she's like, I can't tell you what happened in therapy because they made me sign an NDA. And she's like, why would they think that anybody cares what they have to say at therapy? Anyway, in my book, I will continue to. (laughs) And then she goes, guess what? The therapist said I was right about everything. I can tell you that though. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Child stars are a particular breed of hideous. Anyway, my ego is still checked at the door. The Beverly Hills Police Department holding was shockingly comfortable. And so then we get into her DUI story. It was pretty nothing. She was arrested October 29th, 2010 because she had like a bottle of wine before driving to her boyfriend's house. And then she got pulled over in his driveway. So she's like, I don't know, I guess I must have been kind of drunk. And then she gets off kind of scot-free. She has to like put one of those breathalyzers in her car. She doesn't take the breathalyzer and she's like, which my brother, a cop, told me to do. And I'm like, the cops are the worst. (laughs) And then people are like, oh, no, no, no. I know a cop. He told me exactly how to get away with this deadly thing I was doing. Totally. I know how to drink and drive good because my brother's a cop and he taught me exactly the best way to do it. And she does acknowledge. She's like, yeah, I guess I like could have killed someone and that would have been so bad. So I stopped drinking a lot, but not always. She's also like, just take a taxi. But then later she's like, The best rule for a date is always drive yourself because then you can't get too drunk, but you have to drive home. And I'm like, okay. And then this is when she goes to hypnotherapy for picking. And they're like, hey, it seems like you're unhappy with yourself. And she's like, yeah, it turned out that between the divorce and being told that I was only a body girl, not a face girl, I developed some self-harm habits. She's like, I'm allowed to have tweezers again, but um, I get it. It feels so good when you're in so much physical pain and you can't remember the emotional pain. (laughs) I will say something mean that Leanne and Eddie would do to her is that she didn't have any of their phone numbers and she wasn't allowed to. And so sometimes she'd call to get a hold of her sons and she couldn't find out where they are for days. And that is mean. That is really mean. Since I was able to curb the picking, I decided to focus on healthier ways to make me feel confident about my skin. Was the picking helping your skin? My list might seem extensive, but I assure you each procedure is completely necessary for me. So here's an interesting list of what a top model was doing in L.A. in 2014. Once a month, I treat myself to an IPL, intense pulse light, photo facial to help reduce brown spots and acne scars. Every other month, I go for a more intense laser therapy called Perfecta. I give myself weekly Jesner lactic acid peels to rejuvenate my skin and tighten my pores. Botox has been a part of my life for 15 years. Today, I get it in my forehead, around my eyes, and for my bunny lines around the bridge of my nose. I also dabble in fillers for my smile lines, the lines around my lips, and my acne scars. 
Right after Eddie and I split up, I got fillers in my cheeks, but I absolutely hated it. I was totally unrecognizable. I'll never do it again. I also do all therapy to tighten my jawline and neck, and it hurts like a motherfucker. She definitely is getting more filler in her cheeks. She looks fucking insane right now. I think she got a full facelift. There's like something in there. I was looking at her and I literally was like, who is this? And it was her. And it was on her own Instagram. And that's how unrecognizable she was. She also does Pilates. And she says that dressing well is really good for your confidence. She gives people a little shopping list because she says it doesn't take a fortune to look like a million bucks. If you want to look like a million bucks, you got to wear skinny jeans, a fitted black blazer, stilettos, and a white tank top. Good idea. (laughs) A billionaire saved my life. So this is her first boyfriend. And I think the only person she's really dated since Eddie, to my knowledge. Wow. In the last 10 years, yeah. So she dates this billionaire who's like a real estate developer. And she's not attracted to him, but he like keeps on trying to woo her with vacations. And finally, she's like, I guess I'll go on vacation. He's a real estate developer, so he has a house everywhere. It's like such a fancy vacation that she's like, okay, actually, maybe I do have a crush on him. (laughs) And so then they start dating for a few months. So she tells Cindy Crawford, who's friends with this guy, I'm going to introduce him to my kids. And Cindy's like, don't do that. And Brandy's like, why? What do you know? And then it turns out that they had actually never become exclusive and that he was dating a lot of models. And that's why they weren't boyfriend, girlfriend yet after eight months. And then she's like, yeah, he started getting sick of me and I became a booty call. And then I just started dating other people. And he's like, I don't care. So I finally had to break up with him. And I'm like, I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that he had to like come pick you up from your DUI and you were always drunk and sloppy. I also just think that if he's dating like 18 other people, I I wonder how long the phases last. Like she played really hard to get at first. And so I think that got him extra interested. But like, did you break up with him or did you guys just kind of stop calling each other? But she doesn't regret it, even though he didn't get her many nice gifts. (laughs) Ultimately, dating him reminded me again that I was an individual and not the forgotten half of an almost famous couple. It allowed me to develop the self-confidence I needed to move past my ex-husband, deal with the pain of our split, and meet someone worthy of my brand new vagina. It's so funny. She's like, I lost my sense of self in my relationship with Eddie. Luckily, dating someone else taught me I was dateable again, which reminded me that my sense of self is somebody who is dateable. (laughs) I can't wait to meet the new me. She goes, I'll always have love for him. I'm like, he does not remember your name. (laughs) So then rumors start swirling that this other half of a tabloid love triangle might be cast on The Real Housewives. A photo goes viral of her and Adrian Maloof at a charity event. And then she gets a call asking if she wants to test for The Housewives. It sounds like she doesn't do well because they don't call her back for a while. And then randomly one Tuesday, they're like, do you want to come to a party tomorrow? So she goes and she acts like herself and she loves it. And whoever would have guessed that three years later, she'd be so successful with a house and a children and a podcast and a book. It was official. I had moved on. The great accomplishment of this book is that now she is her own name. And when you Google her name, you don't see articles about Eddie and Leanne. You only see articles about Brandy getting drunk on TV. The first line in her acknowledgments is, I would like to thank my ex-husband, Edward Tribrian, for giving me all the material I would need to write this book. And then she's like, I am finally my own person. And so thank you to my ex-husband for giving me a story. Uh, You brought me to life. I was just a wooden boy. She has the face of a deranged Pinocchio. Let me tell you, she's got some real jigsaw looking cheekbone. You made a wish upon a star and then... But something went horribly wrong and a witch cursed you. (laughs) And now I get more and more twisted. I don't like that voice at all. Ashley, thoughts? You know, I'm glad she makes money now because God forbid she would have had to sell nudes. I'm glad that this book brought us back to Real Housewives of Beverly Hills in its heyday. I am excited to watch. I'm excited for you to watch. I'm excited to talk about it on the Patreon. And I feel like this was so benevolent of us to give Brandy Glanville even a moment of anybody's time of thought because she really is just like snooky tall. She really is just a nothing idiot. How fertile would you say the soil is? Oh, one. I think if this stuff gets wet, you're going to get slippery. And how many warm teenies would you like to have with Brandy? None. Same, same, same. I really don't think she would be a fun person to be in the same room as because I do think she seems like one of those loose cannons where like she could be your best friend or she could be your worst enemy, but like not in a way that any behavior could necessarily predict the outcome. I also don't think she's somebody that like even escalates things. She's somebody that just shows up and screams and you're like, why are you screaming? You know what I mean? She's not like fights fire with fire. She just shows up and is fire. Yes. And who do we love? We love our five-star reviewing wormies. 